All right, a good morning to my Upper Bound class of Fork to Dixie River Baptist Church, and I just uh, I'm welcoming you uh, this morning on the, I guess it's the third weekend now of April or, uh, that we're doing this, and um, uh, we've had a, a lot of a success of, of people watching uh, these uh, online lessons and watching Brother Dwayne and uh, it's really getting out to a lot more people even beside the church. Man, that's a great thing. And, and we just thank the Lord for that. So we, it's good to be uh, with you this morning. It will be better uh, when the, we can be with you again in person. And I'm thinking that that will happen uh, hopefully fairly soon. So keep praying if you will. Uh, you know, most of all, I, I challenge uh, my Sunday school class and I challenge uh, church members just have to pray for each other. Pray for our church members. Uh, pray for uh, uh, them to have, uh, you know, uh, patience and have uh, their faith in God uh, just uplifted as we go through these things. And, and I know Brother Dwayne, uh, he's been working hard to keep everybody up uh, on uh, uh, these devotions and things like that. Man, I'll tell you what, I really appreciate him doing that. And, uh, and, and he is just reminding us every day that God has got this. And if you look around, I know a lot of you are on Facebook. I think you're seeing a lot on Facebook that God is, has got this. And there's a lot of things that are happening uh, under God's uh, uh, control and what's going on. So God does have this. Uh, let's just be patient uh, with God and, and it will work out. Will it work out in our time? I'm not sure that it will be that. Uh, but it will work out in God's time. So just... Pray for a church family each and every day. Pray for your families. Pray for uh, the ones that are putting this on uh, every weekend and that's involved in that. Lift them up, if you will, too, and and, and we'll we'll get through this. And man, when we have a when we do get back to where we can get together, it is going to be a reunion, uh, big time. So just keep that in mind that that is coming, and keep that uh, there in your heart because it is coming. So if you will this morning. If you want to get in your Bibles, if you want to get in our Sunday school lesson, we can turn to, uh, to Romans chapter 8, if you will. Uh, we're going through Romans chapter 8, I think, through uh, verses 24. And uh, you can look at that, or if you got your Sunday school book, you can open it up uh, as well. This morning, we're going to talk about secured. What he's talking about, um, Paul is, is being secured uh, in your salvation. Being secured uh, through the Spirit of God that it dwells in you through uh, the Holy Spirit. And Paul has talked about even in, in the latter part of chapter 7, if you will, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can look at it. Paul had talked about in that, about just striving and fighting with the old nature. And let me tell you something, the old nature can have a big, big hold on you anytime that you uh, just let the Spirit kind of slip away there a little bit and not let it be in control. And, and and Satan can get back and he can get a hold of you and you can start uh, just doing the things of the flesh. And Paul was talking about this in chapter 7 in the last part of that about fighting with the flesh. And, and just real quickly in verse 19 he says, For the good that I would do uh, that I, I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. And he's talking about here in, chapter, uh, in verse 20 he says, Now if I do that, I would not. It is not more that that it's not more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul is letting us know through these scriptures here that even though we have the Spirit of, of God in us, that the old nature is still there fighting uh, against us. Let me tell you something. If you are a Christian today, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. The devil will work. Five times harder or more than that on a Christian person than he will a lost person. The only thing the devil fights really against a lost person is, is to keep him lost. <laughs> if you know what I mean. That's the only thing the devil wants to do against a lost person. Just keep him lost. Keep him confused to where he don't accept Christ. But boy, when you do accept Christ, and when you do turn your life over to Jesus, Satan works just tremendously hard for what he, he can't do nothing about your salvation, but boy, he can run your fellowship with God your whole life if you let him do that. And Paul is talking about this old nature, you know, that is causing this to happen to him. He said, I find then 
at law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And he says here in verse 22, he said, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. What he's talking about here, he's fighting. You know, the law of God, that inward uh, spiritual thing that God had given him uh, through Jesus. He's trying uh, to, to fight the, that old nature with that spirit. And, and jump to, to uh, uh, verse 24, he says, You know, it says, O wretched man that I am. He said, Who should deliver me from the body? of this death and he's talking about God here he said who's going to deliver me out of this and see as a, as a saved person we have that spirit of God in us all we have to do is, is just tap into that it's there for us to fight all the evil things that Satan throw at us in our life as Christians and he's, Paul says in 20, verse 25 he said I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind of myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. What he's talking about here is, he says that that spirit enables them to be able to fight the law of sin. He's fighting the flesh. That helps him keep uh, fighting against that flesh and the devil and stuff that tries uh, to keep. You know, you would think that in Paul himself in this and these verses that he's talking about here, you would think that Paul didn't have any trouble Paul was a dedicated man to God and, and Paul did, was doing everything he could for the cause of Christ. And you would think Paul wouldn't have that much of a fight with Satan. But what's he tell us? He tells us here in verse 24 that he's a wretched man. He said, I'm a wretched man. I'm still fighting all that sin that's, that's in me, that old nature that's in me. He said, I'm a wretched man. And he said, only God can deliver me out of that. And he really, in the sense here, he's thanking God that that spirit of Christ is in him that helps him fight against that old nature. And it's a spiritual warfare from then on out that he talks about there. And Paul is he's saying that God is enabling me to do that. And he says the Holy Spirit, you know, and Brother McGee talks about here, he said the sanctify, sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit in a regeneration, in a regenerated life of the believer, delivering the believer from power sin. So what Paul, what he's talking about here, what Brother McGee's talking about here, he said that power of that Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ is in us, it gives us the power to fight against that part of sin and that part of that old nature that is in us. So we get in this in chapter 8 and we talk about the new man. We talk about how that, that when we become Christians and when we saved and when that Spirit of Christ is inside of us, that it gives us a new nature. We have a new nature inside of us where that Spirit has come to dwell in us. And he says, in eight, chapter 8, verse 1, he says, and Therefore, is there for no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What he's talking about here, there's no condemnation now that we're in Christ. We, you know, as far as sin, that, con that condemn we had in sin before we were born to Jesus is not there no more. Jesus took care of that on the cross and He told us that there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Sin cannot change the fact that one day through salvation that we're going to spend eternity with God. But sin can change a fellowship with God if we let our old nature uh, get a hand on us. And he says, however, he said it wasn't he was enjoying a Christian life. He was, he thinks Paul's talking, he was a failure. And he was a wretched man. And God wanted him to have joy in his life. And now, now he says, he has done this. And, and talking about the next verse here, he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. What's he talking about here? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about Jesus that we talked about here uh, last weekend and about Easter and stuff, that, that Jesus had made him free from the law of sin. The law of sin, what was the law of sin? The law of sin pointed us toward death. And he said through salvation, he said, I'm free from that. I'm free from that death that the law pointed toward in that. The Spirit here through the Holy Spirit brings us you know, the life because it's essential to us. And it says, in Christ, it means that the Holy Spirit is, 
is in complete union with Jesus Christ. What he's saying here is, he's saying that, that, that here the Paul Spirit and, and Christ Spirit are on the same level. In other words, through Christ, and if we heed ourselves to the Spirit that leads us, that we have complete union with Christ. And the law of sin and death is authority over sin in the old nature, but it has no authority over us on the new nature. That's what Paul is trying to put across to us here. He says in verse 3, he says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak from the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What's he talking about? He's talking about that the Spirit has caused us to be righteous people. When we become saved and when Jesus comes into our heart, we become righteous people through the blood of Jesus Christ. It was impossible for the law to save us anymore. He could not do that. Only the blood of Jesus could take us away from that. It says in verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit. And what he's talking about, he's talking about us as Christians. You know, where is our mindset today as Christians? Do we mind the things of the flesh? Do we go after the things of the flesh as Christian people? Or do we mind the Spirit? Do we go after the things of the Spirit? Do we go after the things of God? Do we live a life that is pleasing to God. He's saying here, the natural man will set itself against the things of the flesh. The spiritual man will set itself through the things of the Spirit. But let me tell you something. That new nature is there, but the old nature is also there fighting against that new nature. And he's saying here, which one do we mind here? Which one are we, are we trying to serve here in that? And he says in verse 6, he's for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life of peace. For it says the carnal man means that you are separated from the fellowship of God. Now you've got to understand what he's saying here is he's not saying, talking to Christian people here, he's not saying that we're not saved anymore. But when we let that carnal's part come out of our, in our body and, and serve the flesh, that what happened here is that we're separated from God. We as Christian people don't serve God the way we should and if we're not obedient to the things of God, we become separated from Him. You know, if you want a, a little bit of an explanation of that, if you're a parent and you've got kids, and when your kids get older and stuff and they start wanting to do the things of their own selves and not doing the things that you would have them to do, what happens with those kids? They get separated from you. They don't have conversations with you like they used to. They don't come and talk to you like they used to. Because why do they do it? Because they're doing things that you have told them not to do. They're doing things that you have advised them not to do. That you have, that, you know, they're, they're going against the rules that you set in the household. Just like God. God had His own set of rules for us. And when we go against those rules of God, we become separated from Him in fellowship. And we don't have much conversation with Him anymore due to that. And if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. You don't have much conversation with your kids when you guys are not spiritually connected with each other and, and that child is doing the thing that you would have him uh, to do, uh, hopefully under the leadership of God in that sense. And Brother McGee says, there's one thing for sure. If you are not, if you are living in the flesh, you are a child. And he said, and you are a child of God. You are not having fellowship with God. And the next thing he says, he says, you cannot. You cannot have fellowship with God if you're separated from Him. You can't do. You can't have both in that. You have to confess your sins before God. But the only way you're going to ever be able to come back in a right fellowship with God is say, God, I am sorry. That it come to this, I'm sorry that I've done this and separated myself from you, that I want you to forgive me and I want to get back within the fellowship with you. And in verse 7 and 8 it says, Because 
Listen to what he said, because the carnal mind. What he's talking about in the carnal mind, he's talking about the fleshly mind of everybody. And he's also talking about even the fleshly mind of a, of a, of a Christian is with enmity with God. In other words, he's saying, he's saying that is against God. If you are, are living a carnal life, he's talking about, he said, you're minded so you're against the things of God out there. What would happen in our days and in, in, in our lives in America if, if a Christian has come back and started obeying the things of God? Where would we be today? Where would we be later on? Man, I, I tell you what, I hope when this thing is over with that, that, that we end up here and other places, it's going to be a major revival going on. I'm telling you something, people. There's going to be a lot of people, I think, when we open these doors again that haven't been in this church for a long time, maybe not have been in this church at all, they may walk through that door of this church as soon as they open this thing back up. People through this, what's going on, are drawing closer God. Christians are drawing closer back to God, and I really feel like that we're going to see that. I think we're going to say, I really believe we're going to see that. But he says it's an empty against it's empty against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Our fleshly thinking is not subject to the law of God. And this is what he says here, neither can it be. You know, sometimes people like to rationalize the things that they do in their life. Christian people I'm talking about. They like to rationalize some of the things they do. But this verse tells me, he says, that for it is not subject to the law of God, he said, neither indeed can it, can it be. In other words, when we're rationalizing the things on how we live our Christian lives, it might not be right with God, but just because we rationalize it, to think it's okay, doesn't mean it's okay with God. And I think that's what we're seeing. He says, so then, that they are in the flesh, cannot please God. There is no way in the world. We know for a fact that the lost person cannot please God. But we have to understand that a saved person, if he is living in the flesh and not heed to the Spirit of God, he cannot please God as well. And therefore, the separation comes by. He says he's only, on, only dead in trespasses and sin, but, but active in rebellion against God. Brother McGee says, if you're not doing that, if you're living flesh your life, you're in a rebellion against God. You say, now wait a minute. No, I'm not trying to rebel God. What a sense you are. If you're not living for Him the way you should, and you're separated because of the things you're done, you're in a rebellion against God. It's no different again with the kids. When the kids are not doing what their parents are telling them to do that's right, and they're not doing it, what they're doing? They're rebelling against their parents, right? We've all been there. We've seen that. How they, and you see it more and more today than you do then, but you see a rebellion against that. And said in verse 9, see, but you are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit. You're not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit. You have the Spirit of God. He said, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. What's he talking about here? He's talking about if you don't have that Spirit of God in you, then you're not His. Unless you have that Spirit in Him, you're not His, He's saying. You could do the rebellion. It'll be there. It'll be natural for what it is. And He says here that, this, that, that, that but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God, He's talking about it really dwells in He said the true mark of a, a born-again believer and a genuine Christian is He that he is dwelt, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Has to guide you. That has to be indwelt in you. There's a lot of good people out there. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good people out there that are not indwelt in the Holy Spirit. That's a hard thing to see. That's a hard thing to look at and see, hey, you know, you're a great person, but you don't have a dwelling in the Holy Spirit in you to make you a better person. <laughs> You know, and that's what he's saying. Listen to what Paul said. Paul said in Corinthians, he said, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? Ye are not your own. 
When we became to Christ, we became His. He became our Father, right? So we became His. We are not our own anymore. He's telling us that we're not our own. We, know we should be obedient to His call and to His laws and to His word. The believer is a new creation. He's a new person that God has made. When you come to know Him, you become a new, a new person. Brother McKee says, do you love Him? Do you want to serve Him? Is, are these things uttermost in your mind, in your heart, as a Christian? Or are you rebellious against God? I hope to see a big, great turning back to God through all the process of what's going on right now. Verse 10, he says, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. In other words, he's saying, because that Spirit is in you, it may sin no effect as far as what happens to your immortal soul and your body. Christ took care of that on the cross. It has no effect there anymore because of what the Spirit has done. The sin body, and it says, he says in here, it says, if Christ be in you, the body indeed is dead on account of sin. But Christ took care of that. He took care of that on the cross for us that, that we don't have to worry about that anymore, but we still have to worry about our fellowship and what we're doing. We still have to worry about how that we're letting that spirit that it dwells in us cause us to be obedient to God. In verse 11 it says, But if the Spirit of Him that, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, he says in verse 12, Brethren, you are debtors not to the flesh to life. You are debtors not to the flesh to life after the flesh. In other words, in verse 11 he's saying here, because of what Christ has done and because of what God did in raising Him from the dead, we inherit that same thing. We inherit that same thing that, that also our bodies, immortal bodies by the Spirit that dwells in Him will be able to be done the same way that God done Jesus and raised Him from the dead. In verse 13, He says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And he says, Brother McGee, I quote here, he says, if you are a child of God and you have unconfessed sin in your life, do you want to go to church? <laughs> Remember what I was talking about a while ago? Do you want to go to church if you have unconfessed sin? Do you want to read your Bible? No. Do you want to do that? Do you want to pray? And of course he said, no, you don't. If you're separated from God, you don't want to do these things. If people wanted to go to church, they would be here. <laughs> if they don't want to go to church, they won't be here. It's as simple as that. But what he's saying here is, if, if you let the Spirit to dwell inside you, pull you in the direction that you're supposed to be going, you will want to go to church. You will want to read the Bible. You will want to do the things that God wants you to do. And you would want to pray. You know, I told you probably a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, that through what's going on right now, that there's probably more people, more Christian people that have started praying right now than has probably prayed in a long, 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 long time. See what I mean? God has a way of getting our attention, don't He? He has a way of getting our attention. But He says here, do you really want to pray? Do you really want to come to church? Do you really want to study your Bible? Listen. If it weren't for that, where would us Christians be right now if we didn't do those things? If we didn't want to do that? You know, if it wasn't, and I've said this many, many times, if it wasn't for uh, becoming a Sunday school teacher over these years and stuff like that, I'm not sure that I would have the knowledge of the Bible that I have now. Because that has pushed me to read and to study and do that. I also, it's changed my life more by doing that as well. And, and that to me, I, can, I think I can contest that but reading and studying this and praying and coming to church has changed my life every day or every month or every year by doing 
this, and I can't believe that a Christian wouldn't want that. I couldn't believe that a Christian but won't be separated that much from God that they couldn't have that. But he's calling them back. He, he talks about here in a new man in verse 14. He says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you're led by the Spirit, you are the sons of God. If you're led by the Holy Spirit, and if you let yourself be led by that Spirit that it dwells in you, you hear the things of God. You hear the voice. You hear when He's calling you to do something. You hear when He's put something on your heart to do this or that because the Bible says if my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So He's saying here that you can hear Him through that Spirit that it dwells. He said you are the sons of God. He is our Father. He says for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby you cry, I have a father, and I have a father means that he is our dad. It's the word for daddy. A lot of us call our own fathers daddy. Some of them call them dad, some call them daddy, some of them call them, uh, you know, Paul, or different things, but they do that. But what it is, is recognizing who he is. They're recognizing that he is their father through that. But listen to what he says in verse, the first part of verse 15. He says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage of fear. There's a lot of people that's feared right now. There's a lot of people that's in fear right now. There's a lot of Christian people that's in fear. But the Bible teaches us that the Spirit does not give us the bondage of fear. But we do have common sense. <laughs> you know, we've got common sense to do things that we should do. But we should not be feared because... Has somebody ever heard say in the last two or three weeks, God got this? <laughs> if you know what I mean. If you listen to that. There's where our fear should be set to in the God that God's got this and God would take care of us. And that's what Paul is talking about here. We didn't receive the spirit of fear from the things that go on, from the tribulations in our life because we do know that God is in control and He's got this. But we should take that and drive down the road 90 miles an hour and say, I'm fear to God take care of me that I won't wreck and kill myself. You've got to have common sense through things. That's the difference in them. But God is a Father, and we do that. And He said, The Spirit is set bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. God right now is assuring us Christians of who we are in these troubled times. We are His, and, and He will take care of us, and our spirit bears witness with His spirit. You know, I always said, if you ever want to be in the perfect will of God, it's when His will and our will line up together. That's when we're in the perfect will of God. That's the only time we can be in the perfect will of God. But He says here that the Spirit itself bears witness with ours. We're come together. We're together there. It's combined together in there. And he tells in verse 17, and he says, If the children then heirs of heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, and if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. We go through everything that God has, that Jesus has gone through, that God has allowed him to go through. And we also go through the same things with that with him and with us through him. We are heirs through all of that. We, 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 we're joining through the suffering and we're joining also with the glorified part as well. We receive the same thing that Christ receives. But He's telling us here in these verses that we're new men and we're, we're changed people. It says in verse 18, it talks about a new creature. It says, For I reckon that the suffering of these present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He's talking about the suffering that we have is not near compared to the glory that we're going to share on these days. That's hope, people. That's what we look at all the time. That's the hope that we're saying here that all the things that, that have happened to us, and all the suffering that we go through, no matter what it is, where it is, and and, and when it is, it's not compared to the glory that we're going to share with Jesus one of these days. 
That's the hope that we look forward to. When we see that hope, when we look at that, when we see that, and but we look at ourselves and the things that we're going through, but that hope gives us more hope. And it gives us more confidence in the things that's going to happen to us later on. That one of these days that we will receive that when time comes. That's more glorious than what's going on. He says the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know, creation, Brother McGree says, however creation is, is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation is like a veiled statue today. When the sons of God have removed the outward covering of this flesh, creation also will be unveiled. And so what a glorious day that will be. You know, that's going to happen one of these days, ain't it? All of this is going to be changed, you know. As a new man in Christ, we're changed right now. But even creation he's talking about is going to change as well. And he says in verse 20, For the creature was made subject to the vanity, not willing that by but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. We know when I think of vanity, the first person comes to my mind is Solomon. Solomon had all these things in his life and all the luxuries and things, and when it was all over it till the end, he counted it nothing but just vanity. And vanity means nothing, decay, worth nothing. That Paul, I mean that Solomon talks about. There And that's what he's saying here, that, that this stuff right now is vanity. But one day it's all going to be new. And one day it's all going to be sinless. And one day it's all going to be us with Jesus Christ and there's no more, no more suffering to there to be anymore at any time. You know, we go back and we talk about creation and we talk about the time of when it started and the, and the curse of the sin came upon Adam and his disobedience, but the physical world also came under the curse of the same thing. You remember what God has said about the curse after that that He put on uh, the earth and to put on man and what He had to do because of sin. This earth groans right now. All the things that you see happening going on in this earth today is groaning from the corruption of sin. But one day, all that's going to be made new again, verse 1 on, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto a glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and traileth in pain together until now. He's talking about that now. He's saying how, and even today, how that, that's going on and how that happened. But one day, it's all going to be right the way it should have been where it come from, from the beginning of sin. It's going to go back to that. You know, that's a whole, you know, we talk about the Lion King and the circle of life. I love the Lion King. I love the Lion King. I'm telling you, I watch that thing every time it comes on. But you know, we talked about the circle of life there. But in a sense, there's a circle of life with us because whenever sin started, before sin started in this world, before Adam and Eve sinned, all that stuff that Paul's talking about here was going on right then. There was no sin. There was no groaning. There was no tears. There was no nothing but, but fellowship with God until sin come on. So what's going to happen here? That's got to come full circle back to that again. And God's going to change it all back. And He's going to take it. Christ went to the cross. He made it possible for us to be a part of that. But He's going to change it all back with a new heaven and a new earth and new everything. It's going to be right back before the day sin ever come into this world. Unreal, man. Verse 23, He says, And now, only they... Ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even within our, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. And it says in verse 24, So we, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Now what he's saying, if you see it, it's bad. 
<laughs> you don't have to hope for something you see. But he's talking about the hope that the saved man has that we cannot see right now, but it's coming one day. It's there. The Bible teaches us that it will be there. That hope that we receive from Christ, that, that circle, that full circle that comes right back to the day that four Adam and Eve sin again and they walked in the garden with God. That's the hope we're looking for. And that's the hope that's going to come. The passage in verse 25 says, For if we, if, if we hope for that uh, we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. <laughs> we got to wait for it. It's around the corner, maybe. It's closer than it has been, ain't it? So how secure are we in our walk with God today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for, for just being able to open it up and study. Lord, how that you tell us, Lord, in your word, even though uh, we're going through troubled times, you tell us, Lord, to be patient. You tell us to be patient and wait. You tell us, Lord, to, to look forward to the hope that we have, Lord, in you. One day when it all becomes new and all this is gone, and we become spending eternal life with you, Lord, and the only way, Lord, that we can do this through your Son, Jesus Christ. And through, Lord, the, the time that He went on the cross and through the part, Lord, that He defeated death and sin and through the point, Lord, that He was resurrected. And all that, Lord, He gained victory over that we may have this fellowship and we may have that relationship, Lord, with Him now, waiting for that time, waiting, Lord, for that blessed hope that will come to us one day. Lord, I pray, Lord, today as we... As we've gone through this lesson, Lord, to help us to understand, Lord, as Christians, it's not a good time to be separated from you. It's not a good time to, to let the world 